Welcome to part four of Understanding the Measurement series. And in this video, we're gonna continue talking about how the Spinorama data can provide you with a very accurate predicted in-room response, taking the guesswork out of what speakers you should buy and providing you with a good idea of what a speaker is gonna sound like in your actual room. What would you say if I told you that within a pretty low degree of error, I could predict how a speaker is going to perform in your room. Wouldn't you want to know that? Wouldn't that take a whole lot of guesswork out of trying to figure out what speaker makes the most sense for you outside of just talking about a quote unquote, you know, perfect speaker. If you know what you like, you know, the sound that you're going after. And I can tell you that this speaker is probably going to match that profile within a, you know, plus or minus two dB window in your actual room. That's great information to have. And that's what makes a predicted in-room response invaluable. The predicted in-room response is built off of the Spinorama data that we talked about in part three of this series. Once again, this content is gonna focus on what is provided in the CTA 2034 specification, which I'm showing here on screen. I will also provide a link where you can go and download this yourself if you'd like to. The majority of this content is built off of the work by Dr. Floyd Tool and Dr. Sean Olive. You can read a lot about that in this book right here. It is a fantastic book if you're trying to understand sound, speakers, and how they interact in your room. I will also provide a link to that book via Amazon in the descriptions below. This paragraph describes how the estimated in-room response or the predicted in-room response came to be. And I'm not gonna read it to you in full. You can go do that yourself. What this basically says is through a series of tests, through some trial and error, it was discovered that a percentage of the on-axis response, early reflections response, and the sound power all rolled up into a particular equation would allow you to predict how a speaker is gonna perform in your room. But there are obvious caveats, and I will point those out in here. As this document states, some rooms are excessively reflective, live. Sometimes rooms are excessively dead, and it depends on the makeup of your room. But what I can tell you is that in pretty much every case that I've tested a speaker and then applied the estimated in-room response to what I measured in the room using the moving microphone method and my UMIC-1 from Mini DSP, those two curves have lined up, I mean, extremely, extremely well above a certain point. That point is gonna be in the mid-band region. And in my experience, it's been about 500 Hertz. Every room is gonna be a little bit different. In the document, they actually note that it is typically in 300 to 400 hertz region, and they talk about what makes that up as in the Schroeder frequency, which I will try to find a link, a good link that describes that and throw it into the description below if I can. But for now, basically what that means is there is a point where sounds are reflected less and less as you go lower in frequency, and instead those sound waves just start to stack up on top of each other. And when you get into that region and below, the prediction is less accurate. And as I said, in my case, that happens to be around 500 hertz or so, give or take. But above that point in my room, the prediction lines up quite well with what I actually measure. What I'm going to do is walk you through some examples of what the prediction was via the spin data and then what I actually measured in my room so you can see the strong similarities in the correlation between the prediction and the actual in-room response. This is an example of the predicted in-room response based on the Kali IN5's Spinorama data. And as you can tell, it's in the simple format that you're used to seeing up until this point. In order for me to overlay the real in-room response that I take via the RTA using REW software and UMIC1 microphone along with, was it pseudo random pink noise? I think is which one I use. I'm gonna show you a different graphic that actually comes from REW's interface. And that is this. In this case, what we see in the black line is the prediction from the Spinorama data. The red and the blue lines are different measurements in the room. And the reason that I measured this speaker at two different locations is one position is near field. I think it was like a, a meter and a half or so from the speakers. And then the other position was the typical far field distance, which was about three and a half meters in this case. So at my couch in the near field, there is less room influence in the lower frequency response. And you can kind of see that because the blue is starting to line up more uh, better, I guess, with the black response, 
as opposed to the red where there's more of a difference in this lower mid band region. Uh, going into the higher frequency, however, above that 500 hertz point that I mentioned previously, we can see that both of the curves line up really, really well. And the main difference is being above 10 kilohertz, which I've typically noticed that may just be because I have a more lively room and I don't have any kind of sound absorption in the living room where I measure these speakers at for the in-room response. The other thing to note with this particular set of measurements is again, the blue being the near field measurement. So I'm physically closer to the speakers. The high frequency content is just higher in level than the high frequency content of the far field measurement. And that's expected because you are physically closer to the speaker. You're getting less interaction with the room, uh, less fall off as you go further away from the speaker and have to deal with more reflections in the far field. The next example I'm going to give you is one of JBL's HDI 3800. Again, this is the predicted in-room response based off the Spinorama data. And what you can see here is a pretty decent, you know, trend line going downhill. Um, what you're looking for generally is just a one dB per octave fall off rate. And that again is a general observation, depending on what sound you typically prefer, uh, how much lateral reflection you prefer, those kind of things. That curve or that desire that you're looking for could be different from what I just referenced, which again was the negative one dB per octave slope. So if I was looking for that slope here, if we just drew a line from about 200 Hertz down to uh, 10 kilohertz or so, we would expect about a seven dB drop in overall response, which would put my endpoint somewhere down here. And what we can see generally speaking is that the mid range is a little bit more boosted through that region and the highs are a little bit more flat. So this could come off as a you know mid-range heavy speaker, uh, as well as maybe a bright or forward speaker, depending on, again, the preference that you look for and what the response of your room actually is, you know how lively it is or how dead it is. But that's the Spinorama estimated in-room response. Now let's look at the actual measured response overlaid with the estimation. Here again, we have the measured in-room response taken via REW. And the black is the estimation from the spin data and in the teal color is the actual measured in room response above about 500 Hertz is where I'm seeing the estimation line up with the actual in room response. Uh, and the two match extremely well. I mean, you're within plus or minus one DB above 500 Hertz until again, you get to this very, very high frequency content. I mean, imagine with that degree of accuracy, you're able to predict how a speaker is going to perform in your room. That's crazy. And for people who say, you know, that measurements can't tell you anything, I think this is pretty much the end to that argument. They certainly can tell you a lot. They may not be able to tell you everything, but they certainly can tell you a whole, whole lot. Now, you may be wondering, what the heck? Why is it so far off on the low frequency? Well, this is just the room. I've got the speakers placed almost at the dead middle of the height of the ceiling and the floor, which puts the, you know, the two floor bounce and the ceiling bounce right roughly around the same bandwidth and it's going to come through right here uh, causes a big suck out in this region so you got the floor bounce and the ceiling bounce coming into play here and then you just got typical low frequency modal issues ideally if i were using this speaker full time i would probably play around with positioning a little bit more i may even try to do some kind of ceiling um, capturing maybe some specific frequency targeted like a helmholtz resonator potentially i don't know that that would actually do the trick here but I would look into more options for, for placement probably. And also, you know, how I can treat the room to see if I can get rid of that. Some things though, you just can't do anything about. I mean, you can't fix floor bounce because nobody's going to be walking on, you know, a foot of padded foam. That's just not going to happen. So floor bounce is always going to be an issue. Ceiling bounce, you can kind of take care of that. But at the low frequencies, it's going to have to be very, very thick foam to, to do anything with or uh, fiberglass or whatever material you use. It's going to have to be very thick to capture down to 200 hertz. And, you know, most domestic living spaces aren't going to have those fixes. So I don't want you to focus too much on this because the low frequency content in your room is probably going to be much different than my room. But the main point again here is that above that transition frequency, above the Schroeder frequency, we can see that the prediction lines up extremely well with the actual in-room response. That's going to do it for today because I could just keep showing you more and more examples, but you're going to see the same thing. There's no point in making this video 30 minutes long if there doesn't actually need to be a reason for it. So we're going to stop this one short. Next time somebody tells you that measurements can't tell you anything, tell them about this. Talk to y'all later. Peace.